And um, I have spent most of my career, I was 20 years, I was a professor uh, in botany. And I spent 15 years on PBS also uh, doing a TV show called Expeditions with Patrick McMillan, where I went all over creation looking at things like carnivorous plants and bringing really what I, what I thought were really cool stories, at least to people, um, engaging things about elements of the world that we don't usually think about. That's what I always love to, to sort of tickle people's minds with. And carnivorous plants are a very popular topic. Um, it's one of the most popular groups of plants because children love thinking that a plant eats an insect, right? Um, that's pretty amazing that you have something that's carnivorous. Okay, well, burst the bubble thing number one, they don't actually eat insects. They don't actually eat anything other than the same thing most plants that are green eat, which is light. So when we say eat, we're usually talking about where they're getting their energy from. That's carbohydrates for a plant. So plants are photosynthetic, means that they get their, if they are photosynthetic and not, not um, uh, parasites, then they're getting their energy from the sun. So what are they really getting out of the insects or other things that they catch? Because these don't just catch insects. In some cases, they catch larger things and smaller things than insects. Um, but what they're really getting is their nutrients. They're getting vitamins. Okay? They're getting nitrogen, uh, particularly, out of the insects. And that's mostly because of the habitat that they grow in. So does everybody know, everybody here knows about Venus flytraps, right? So I brought you guys some Venus flytraps and we have some to ruin right here, okay? <laughs> so if you want to hold one, please feel free. Would you like to hold the pot? Okay, awesome. So the Venus flytrap, Darwin called this the most amazing plant on Earth. Um, you can actually see evidence that it does actually capture mosquitoes, because there's a mosquito dead in that one um, that is just a, the exoskeleton of the mosquito. But the Venus flytrap, most people on Earth don't know where you find Venus flytraps. So who knows where Venus flytraps grow naturally? East Coast, North Carolina. North Carolina, yeah, Wilmington, you guys are so smart. Like when I used to do a bunch of school groups, I always had somebody who, they were right, they were always right, but they, you know, somebody would say Africa or South America or the jungle. And no, it's North Carolina and South Carolina only, just the southeastern corner of the state and of North Carolina and Northeastern South Carolina. Um, but I always had some student that would always say, Walmart. <laughs> they're right. They're correct. They do grow in Walmarts. Um, but they're, they are one of the most poached species of plants on Earth, too, because um, folks tend to, down in the uh, southeastern part of the state, um, not really all their fault because, you know, the local folks in the southeastern part of the state have a hard time making a living, at least before a lot of the development happens. So we're, um, we're sort of I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> really, they're, they're trying to, to make a dollar, but um, shouldn't dig them out of the wild. They're actually protected by law now, uh, and you can you face a fine or, or worse for poaching them out of the wild. Um, but Venus flytraps are a great example that everybody knows about, about carnivorous plants. So um, carnivorous plants, to be carnivorous, they have to um, lure, means they have to have something to attract their prey. Okay, they have to trap their prey, yeah. they have to trap their prey, capture it, and then they have to digest it, okay? Venus flytrap does all of those things. The red coloration on the insides of the trap that glistens, okay, is thought to be what lures insects in. It's simply the color red attracts some insects, and then the glistening indicates, oh, maybe there's some good nectar there, so they might go in and, and visit. The flytrap closes, and when it closes, it, it doesn't want to close on something it's not going to get food out of, right? So what could fall in that flytrap that we wouldn't want to close on? Rain. Yeah, what good's that going to do? It's water. You got that in the soil, right? You don't want to close on a pine needle. You don't want to close on those things. You want to make sure it's alive. So this is so intricate that each side of the Venus flytrap has between three and six little trigger hairs. That's one that has six on that one right there, actually. You can see three and three, but usually they're just one, two, and three, like this one. Um, and those little trigger hairs um, are attached to an enlarged cell. And what happens if you touch one trigger hair, like I just did, nothing happens, right? But if I touch one trigger hair twice in rapid succession or touch more than one, it closes. And that one's 
slow to close because it's the second time that trap is closed. The first time they close really fast, the second time they close really slow. So slow. So all these are slow ones. So you want to try yours? Here, I'll hold it. You can try it. Just kind of drag that across. You can see really well those three hairs. Yeah. So it just needs to feel the Oh, strength. yeah. That one was a little faster. This one's... Before we close this one, let's look at it. Most people think that the Venus flytrap is closing around a hinge. It is not. Um, what it's doing is changing shape. And you can see how, you see how the inside of that leaf is sort of bowed outward? Okay, it's what we would, we would call that uh, convex instead of concave. And what happens when you agitate those is it causes a change in the ionic balance, um, the sodium in particular, across the surface of these cells on one direction or the other. And when it does that, the water follows that sodium out of the cell and changes shape. And so the shape change of the cells as it, the electrical impulses are pushed across the surface, they all change shape. And those cells that are all fat on the inside, suddenly all their water goes to the outside behind and the shape changes from this to that. So it's really a, a shape change that causes the initial closure. Then following that, what will happen is it will slowly close over the matter of hours around the hinge, which is a much slower thing, to press the, um, each surface of the leaf up against the insect. And this plant, just like pitcher plants, secretes, secretes esterase, amylase, and protease. Um, and that's to break through the exoskeleton, the chitin on the exoskeleton, to get through the joints by the esterate and amylase. And then to get to the goo on the inside with the protease, which is an enzyme that breaks down proteins into stuff like um, nitrate or nitrite or ammonium or ammonia, depending on the exact process. So go ahead and let's close that one, see if it closes a little bit no, it's faster. Okay. You're good at it. <laughs> Oh, that was a fast one. Yeah. See, I knew that one hadn't closed because I could tell by how far it just bowed out. Um, so they will close and yeah, and, and close up tight and then open back up. And the second time, as we saw, they close slower. And the third time, they might not even close at all and eventually just the leaf is going to rot away because it's used up its usefulness. So about three or four closes and then it's done? Yeah, usually two or three closes and then it just falls off. So okay. kids, you know, when you have kids around and they're feeding it hamburger and stuff, that's not what you do with these plants. They don't need anything because we, when we're growing them in cultivation, they've got everything that they need. So they don't actually have to have any insects. But in the wild, these things grow in extremely nutrient-poor habitats that are really highly acidic. Okay? and wet. In case of all of, our, um, all of our carnivorous plants in North Carolina, they grow in, in soils that aren't usually flooded, but they have water close to the surface of the soil, four to six inches below the surface usually, there's the water table. So it's constantly wet and constantly moist at the surface, but it's not flooded over, okay? So that's why they're going to all that trouble to do that, right? And they have to do all those things to really be considered a carnivorous plant. And that one, the plant that moves and captures flies, that's, that's often considered the most outrageously adapted plant uh, on the planet. Okay? Now, I'll show you a few others. This is a two-in-one here. Um, this one has a sundew in there. And sundews are kind of like slow-motion Venus flytraps. You'll notice that a lot of these leaves, uh, the leaf is normally out straight, but a lot of them are curling inward. So the way these work is each leaf has, and these are both examples of active traps, that each leaf has these little hairs on the leaf, trichomes, and each trichome has a little bead of glistening bead on it that's sticky like flypaper. And little insects will be drawn in there just like they are, it's red, and it's glistening, they get drawn in there and they get stuck in the goo on the, um, the sundew. And the sundew slowly curls that leaf in to push the insect against the surface of the leaf where the amylase, esterase, and protease is, is secreted that gets into the insect and gets at um, what's important for it. So obviously that doesn't There's catch no, big things. Um, there is no scent or anything. It, it, it's simply the color that well, lures it. Well, in is some there color? are, uh -huh. um, in, and we're going to look at that in just a second. The not active traps, which you might think, oh, well, they're not as cool because they don't have as good a story. They don't move around. They don't move at all. But pitcher plants actually, to me, are the most fascinating of all of them. Not only are they weird looking, um, but they have really interesting uh, traps. 
So this is the most widespread pitcher plant. You find this from Canada, way north in Canada, all the way down to Florida. Um, and the, at least the group, the purple pitcher plant group. And this is the least intricate of all the traps. Basically what this guy does is he puts out pitchers of water, he secretes into the water, the amylase esterase, protease, and then draws in the insects by producing nectar right along the lip and along the suture of the leaf, okay? Now a pitcher plant leaf is kind of interesting because um, I can illustrate it with this like chorus right here. Really what we have in a pitcher plant leaf is a lot of people think that's a flower. It's not the flower, it's a leaf. And the leaf has simply been rolled like this and sutured along the margin to produce the pitcher, okay? So the abaxial, the bottom side of the leaf is the side that, that is exposed. Now if you had the other side exposed, it would be a problem. Does anybody remember their basic biology to know why? The, the, it breathes from the bottom. Yes, yeah. it has the stomates yeah. along the back, yeah. the underside of the leaf, not the upper side, which is why everything that rolls its leaf rolls it that way instead of the other way around. So that's how they create, that's how they create the pitcher. With the purple pitcher plant, that nectar simply um, comes up to the edge, uh, and we'll look at it on the yellow pitcher plant, it's a little more sexy than the purple pitcher plant, but that nectar is all along here when the pitcher first opens up, just like in the purple pitcher plant, and then it's right here, and it's also right here, and if you feel right there on the back of that, you're welcome to feel it if you want to, it's sticky, okay? Yeah, it's really sticky. Okay, now don't lick your finger after you do that. Um, I'll tell you why in a minute. But the the um, nectar draws in things and because it produces nectar all the way down the suture here a lot of times the first thing that all pitcher plants collect are ants if you think about throwing a candy down on the ground <laughs> right what comes to it ants in a minute and then you know when that first girl ant comes up and she finds the nectar she lays a pheromone trail back over to the mound and it tells all the rest of the ants to come get it so they collect nectar collect nectar collect nectar collect nectar collect 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 they get up to the top, and down she goes, and all of her sisters follow her, right down into the trap, right? And the way the trap works is it's very slick on a purple pitcher plant, on a, um, I mean on a, on a, yeah, on a yellow pitcher plant, on a uh, purple pitcher plant, it's got hairs that point downward that make it hard to crawl up against the hairs, so it's easier to slide down. But when you get inside, down in the middle, in the bottom, towards the bottom of the pitcher, there's little felt-like hairs, and really is almost like felt, that um, point downwards so that when something gets down in, it literally cannot push back out because there's thousands of little hairs pushing down against it to keep it where it is, okay? So once you've done that, produce nectar here for a few days in the spring, you stop because nectar is physiologically expensive. These things grow in poor habitats. You don't want to waste energy doing that. So what they do is they use the dead decomposing body of the ants as bait, or whatever they've caught as bait, because then flies, right, yellow jackets, which love to eat carrion, all come to try and eat that, and when they get into the pitcher, they're done for too, they get caught, right? So it's, it's cool later in the season, after these have been out for a while, to, to cut one open and show everybody what's on the inside, because it's amazing to see what they have consumed. And in the case of each species of pitcher plant specializes on catching different things. The yellow pitcher plant specializes on clumsy flies. So things like um, beetles um, that, can't, that aren't really great at getting around with dexterity, okay? And also things like larger bees and wasps that, were, that might come in, and moths and things that aren't good flyers. And what happens is they have this usually red spot right here that corresponds to a basketball goal, the sweet spot that's outlined with a little square. When they come flying, they see that red and they fly, oh, I'm going to go get this. Boom, they hit the sweet spot and it goes right in the basket, right? And that's so they find beetles a lot of times in the purple pitcher plant. Actually, every time I did this with a, my college classes, we, we'd cut them open in the early fall semester, and we almost always found a dead lizard, a dead frog, and sometimes a dead mouse in there. So it's anything that gets attracted to what's in there, if they get in, 
far enough and if they're small enough to fit in the pitcher, they're done for, right? Um, the Asian pitcher plants are even more interesting. They can have Nepenthes raja has really great big pitchers. Um, not derived from leaves, actually derived from an inflated tendril, so a little totally unrelated. But they're so big that even small monkeys can sometimes get in and get drowned. So, and arboreal rats, which are kind of interesting. All right, so this one is kind of the coolest of all of them to me. This is the white top pitcher plant. And if that one specialized on clumsy flyers, what do you think the attractant here is? Well, it gets ants and it gets, produces nectar. But what do you think this is mostly trying to attract with the white? What pollinates white tubular flowers? Moss. You know? Moss. Moths, yeah. And so the white reflects ambient light at night, the mm -hmm. same way you, when you turn on a light on your porch. And what happens? The clumsy flying moths come up, they fly to the brilliant white, they hit the sweet spot, two points, right? <laughs> you get three points for a butterfly. And this one gets three points a lot, because just like the yellow pitcher plant, and like really now we know all pitcher plants, there's a second way that they capture insects. The nectar that they have, which is why I said don't lick your finger afterwards, the nectar contains a chemical called coneine. Okay, that's an alkaloid. Anything that ends in I-N-E, like caffeine, that we drink, right? Uh, cocaine, right? Those are all alkaloids. They all have some impact on human beings, right? Metabolically or otherwise, many are poisonous. And so with the case of the white top pitcher plant and the yellow pitcher plant, all of them, they produce coneine. And in the case of the white top, butterflies, like buckeye butterflies, which I actually filmed this from my show, will come up and they'll start nectaring from this because that nectar is nectar. It's sweet, but it's laced with poison. And only two things on this planet produce coneine. Poison hemlock, that's the poison that Socrates drank. Granny had the choice, commit suicide or stop teaching people to think. He decided to kill himself, right? And um, all that glistening on this is full of that coneine, which in insects causes a narcoleptic response so that they, when they're sipping on it, they get groggy. If you watch the video, we posted it on our website uh, not too long ago in a piece I did on carnivorous plants. They get groggy and pretty soon they fall in, passed out. And they're in there far enough down that when they come to, they can't get back out. Right? Now the interesting thing is that there's always something smarter than the trap. So there are species of um, mosquitoes that only breed inside the water of purple pitcher plants. There's a species, uh, many species, but a species of moth, uh, not moth, but a uh, wasp called Isodontia philadelphica. It is so smart. She's a, she, they also get in your hose pipes at, at home, the same species, Isodontia. They go down in the tube and they build a layer of sticks and straw in there and then they lay their eggs there so they don't get eaten by the pitcher plant. The babies have a slimy coat on the maggot that keeps them from being dissolved while they're down in the pitcher and they feed on the decomposing bodies of all the insects that the pitcher plant has caught so that the mama wasp doesn't have to do any work. And then when they get ready to come out, they can't get out the top any more than anything else can. What do they do? They chew a hole through the side and they drop out as a little maggot. They form a chrysalis and then they come out and they pop out as a, not a chrysalis, but they, they come out of their exoskeleton. They become an adult Isodontia Philadelphia and they go off looking for another tunnel. To put their I was wondering why I had some holes in the side. That's what it is. Plant. They're all pitcher plant mm -hmm. wasps, I did, Isodontia Philadelphica. Isn't that crazy? So they're really amazing things. They're very simple to grow. Um, you can combine lots of other cool bog plants like the grass pink orchid. So the way that I'll show you how to, um, the easiest way to grow these is in a pot. It's the most successful way. You'll grow them way better in a pot than you'll ever grow them in an in-ground bog like this. Um, the, they, um, the thing about a pot is you can get these for just let next to nothing at Lowe's or Home Depot and you don't want a pot that has a hole in the bottom, okay? You want one plastic that you can drill holes about four or five inches below the top of the pot. You're going to take peat moss and perlite or peat moss and sand. And you can use up to one half peat moss, one half, uh, up to one half perlite, one half sand. But you really can use any amount of sand and peat moss, or sand and perlite that you want, just enough to keep it from being all peat moss. You can just use a little bit, it still works, okay? 
The peat moss you need to mix in a bucket of water beforehand because it's really difficult to get it to uptake um, moisture. So what I do is put a drop of Dawn dishwashing detergent in there for um, a surfactant so that it takes up the water quicker and just a drop won't hurt your pitcher plants. You put a whole bunch in there, it's too much sulfide, you're going to ruin your pitcher plants, don't do that. But you, you just are phosphate, you don't want to do that. So, and then just work the peat moss to get it to soak it up, throw it in your pot, keep doing that until your pot is full of peat moss and perlite, and then you pat it down a little bit and you're ready to plant. Okay? The holes keep the moisture in the, in the pot, keep the water level right there. Okay? So you don't have to have as deep a pot as this. You can use a pot that's only this deep you know, and still accomplish, accomplish the same thing. But when you use a little deeper pot, you have a larger reservoir of wet water down in there. And you don't have to worry about watering it so often to keep the water where it's supposed to be. And when I overwinter in that pot? Absolutely. So with all that, of our carnivorous plants that, um, that you can, other, you know, there are tropical ones like uh -huh. the, uh, the Asian pitcher plants, but all the plants that we sell the, are southeastern native species, and they all have to freeze. If they don't get cold, they'll die. So you can't keep one forever on your windowsill, but you can keep one forever outside just like this and just leave that right outside and let it freeze. These things are hardy all down to like zone five, so they, they don't have a problem with that. Can you grow them in a pot with a like a wet a saucer? Absolutely. So as if you have a pot with holes in the bottom, you just set it in a deep saucer so that the water level in the saucer is about four or five inches below the top of the pot, okay? And that's that's the key. Now, the other thing you have to do is put them in full sun. There's not a single species that wants to grow in shade, and without six hours of light a day, you're not gonna be successful with any of them. So they want a hot, sunny place, super easy setup. If you do it like this, you don't even get weeds because there's no nutrients. So the weeds may pop up a seed, but they're gonna die right away because there's nothing to keep them around. And um, it's just a super low maintenance, crazy, awesome, cool thing that you can have to entertain your kids, your grandkids, and yourself, mm -hmm. right? If you, if you do this, now if you set it on yeah. the brick or concrete or anything, mm -hmm. is it gonna make it too hot in the sun? No? No. Okay. no. It, 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 don't get a black pot, because the black will collect heat, but it's not gonna get too hot. They can tolerate 130 degrees. Okay. Not gonna, not gonna, so all you need pepper. is the peat moss and perlite, no sand? Or, or, or peat moss and sand, right, okay. sand. Yeah. Okay. anything to just break up the peat moss a little bit is okay, but you don't want something that's going to put nutrients in there, and that's why we use clean sand or perlite. Do you have to wash this? Is there a certain type of sand you'd be looking for? Yes, so usually we or? use river sand, uh -huh. um, and some of the sands are coated. So that are like sand clay sand, people. no. Clay sand, no, because okay. it's sometimes coated, um, and the coating might be bad for, for the plant. So uh, an easy, would just get a bag easier. of perlite. <laughs> you know what that is around here. In South Carolina, river sand was available everywhere. It's not here. Yeah. So here it's a little more difficult to find um, lots of river sand for doing stuff like that. Can you grow them from the seeds from the... Um you know, when the pictures Super form the flower. Easy. And yes. So, um, when they, so the flower, which we didn't talk about, but we should. Mm -hmm. This is the flower of a pitcher plant, and the petals are right here around the outside, and they fall off very quickly. And they leave behind this sort of strange um, capsule, like this one's fallen off. Okay, there's the last petal, boom. And you have this weird umbrella it's the stigmatic umbrella. And down here, you have the capsule that's full of seeds, okay? And when that dries out and pops open, the seeds are tiny and they just spread all over in your bog and they all come up. And if you have one species of pitcher plant, that's what you'll have. If you have another species of pitcher plant anywhere nearby, you're gonna get a lot of hybridization because pitcher plants are sluts. They don't care who they breed with. They go everywhere. Well, that's a that's a question. You see so many crosses, you know, in in, the, in various nurseries. How many actual species are there in the North Carolina, South Carolina? Just pure in North wild Carolina type and South species? Carolina, including the mountains. There is the mountain purple pitcher plant, the mountain sweet pitcher plant, which is federally endangered, um, the green pitcher plant at one site in Clay County, which is also federally endangered. 
um, the yellow pitcher plant, the coastal purple pitcher plant, uh, the uh, hooded pitcher plant, just in two counties in the lower coast, the southeastern coastal plain, and the sweet pitcher plant, uh, coastal sweet pitcher plants, they're senior river. So seven species, seven, six species, and there's two varieties of purple pitcher plants, so seven taxa, I think, in North Carolina. I'm not missing any. And hybrids. And lots of hybrids, yeah. yeah. And then in South Carolina, you pick up, in the very south southeastern corner, you pick up parrot pitcher plant at one at least historical location. Um, and in Florida, at Panhandle of Florida, you pick up white top pitcher plant. Gulf Coastal Plain, you pick up tall pitcher plant. Um, Alabama, you pick up the Alabama pitcher plant. You pick up the rosia purple pitcher plant in the Florida Panhandle. Um, and I think that's, did I get them all? <laughs> Alabama, I got. I think that's all the pitcher plant. Well, there's one more variety of rubra, which two, is Viator. Two Alatas. Yeah, possibly two. two and what farms. about the Venus flytraps? How many actual species? One. Pure, just so one species in the entire your... family. Uh -huh. uh, there's one species, if you consider it a separate family from Drosseraceae. They, some people put them in the same family as the, as the Sundews, but it's a monotypic genus, which means one species in a monotypic family, if you recognize the family is distinct as Dianaeaceae. Um, so it's it's pretty unique, yeah, yeah. So all these other, all these cultivars are just people selecting from that yeah. one species? Yeah, yeah, and hybridization and selecting forms, yeah. because like this one, Tarnock, is found in one bog called Tarnock, Tarnock side, Tarnock bog, and it has sterile flowers that have lots and lots of those shields out sepals coming out. And um, it, it has no petals. That's a form that was selected by the Atlanta Botanical Garden and called Tarnock after the site, I guess, where they found it. And um, it's a beautiful one. There are other um, white tops that have green veins instead of red veins, and yellow pitcher plants come in anything from solid red pitchers to solid yellow pitchers to, to dual colored to copper colored because there's a lot of variation in the wild. So I'm working on setting up a bog at home, uh -huh. um, and I keep reading discrepancies about the peat and perlite mixture. Some people say... I've been doing this 35 yeah, years. Yeah, yeah. It does not... You can put slab of peat in there and they're yeah. going to grow, okay? So it doesn't matter how much. You so just need some to... Fine. You just need cool. some to, to break it up. And the okay. perlite's more expensive than the peat. Okay, yeah, because they were saying that uh, perlite is alkaline and it might throw off the pH and I just did a 50-50 mix, so I'm like, oh, I don't want to repot. You're fine. Cool. I mean, that's... You plant, you, that's what we grow them in. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> How high are you going to bring the peat? All the way. All the way? All, all the way, way up? up to you. And then you're going to put your, the top of the plant will be here, so then the roots will be down there. Yep. And right. the roots aren't going to grow beyond where the water, down into the water. They grow just above it. So if we look at the picture, a pitcher plant's roots, roots, you must be from up where I'm from. So. You can see that there's not that much. They don't have a big tap root or anything. They have these rhizomes on the surface and then all these fibrous roots that come down from that. So they don't have a huge root mass, right? So you don't need that much space to make a big pitcher plant happen. And so in the winter, it, you know, if, if say there was a lot of rain and there was water all the way up to the drainage holes and then it free, freezes into a block of ice in the winter. They love it. They're fine. That, that's no problem. No big deal. Yeah, it happens okay. in the wild all the, time. Okay. all the time. Then you just water there from the top. Yeah. So I water from the top and how do you know when you got it watered well enough? Because it's out the sides. Yeah. Start dribbling out the sides. And once it starts dribbling out the sides, you know you got it full enough, right? So that's the easy way. The in-ground way, you have to make sure your overflow is about that far below the surface of the water that the whole thing is, is level across the, um, the entire thing to keep it right. And we, we do some pretty low tech things like put in little peep holes so I can see where the water level is, right? And we can fill it. Um, this one actually has a fill. Bend it on the side. Yeah, fills under the, the like, forest. It actually has a fill there. And this fancy one here has a layer of gravel with um, just a uh, frost cloth on top of it, which keeps the peat on top and we can fill the reservoir from below and water the bog from below. So it's pretty fancy. It's never gonna be as good as this because every time it rains, stuff washes into the bog and that has nutrients. Yeah, so it's never as good in the ground as it is in a pot 
And my favorite way to wake, make in-ground bogs is on the high point in the landscape where nothing will, ro will roll into it. And I raise the lip up yeah. about two, three inches above the soil. So it's okay to get uh, like a, one of those big... Kitty poles are great. Things. Yes. And stick it in the yeah, ground. Absolutely. But, okay. Just leave the lip above and hide it somehow. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. What kind of water? Cap? Um, so, uh, so over a long period of time, tap water has lots of salts and minerals in it. So as if you're watering it with tap water and you're not flushing it with tap water, not flushing it out to leach those things out, as they evaporate, they're going to leave salts behind. And so slowly your plants will start to do poor, more poorly. So every four or five years, I generally dismantle these things. If you can go four years in one of these without dismantling, you're doing something wrong. Because if you plant one pitcher plant, it should be bursting out the sides got well water in four years. Well water can be just as bad. Okay. If it's hard water, it's going to be just as bad. Because these things really are fed with rainwater, which is nothing. Right? Um, so very no nutrients. Um, so some people that are really very obsessive about this will buy like distilled water or an RO unit for their house so that they have reverse osmosis water to put into their carnivorous plants and just get a rain barrel. Or either or a rain barrel's perfect. Or or you know, or just you're gonna have to these plants are gonna continue to grow, grow, grow. You're gonna have to take them out and divide them anyway, so why not just replace it every four years? That's my way of doing it. Thank you guys so much. Thank you. Thanks for being here today. If you haven't tried carnivorous plants, we've got an amazing selection of them up there in Greenhouse 4. Um, take some home with you. Even if you can't plant them for a while, all you got to do is put the pot in a little dish of water and it'll be fine for a long time. So just leave them out all winter? All winter. Okay. Leave them outside. And so the little orchid could go in with any yeah. and all of them? Yeah. That that, fine. The grass pink orchid is super easy to grow under the same conditions. Um, so there's others, the pagonia, there's a number of different uh, water spider orchids and uh, platanthras, which are called fringed orchids. Um, the Harper Acalis that we sell is a wonderful uh, accompaniment. We put all the plants that go with pitcher plants right with our pitcher, right with our carnivorous plants up there in that section. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you guys. Thank you.